year ago, almost to the day, I was on an evening out with friends. It had been a pretty perfect evening. All of our closest friends from university had got together for food and drink, and we hadn't been all together for a long time, so naturally we were really happy to be all reunited. At the end of the evening, I caught the last underground tube back to my home on the other side of London. The journey had run smoothly. I got back to my local station and began to climb the long flight of stairs up to ground level, joking with the woman next to me about how out of breath we both were. We parted at the exit, and I began to walk the 10-minute journey home. As I turned the corner onto my street, my house in sight up ahead, I heard footsteps behind me that seemed to have approached out of nowhere and were picking up pace. Before I had time to process what was happening, a hand was clapped around my mouth so that I could not breathe. And the young man behind me dragged me to the ground, beat my head repeatedly against the pavement until my face began to bleed, kicking me in the back and neck while he began to assault me, ripping off my clothes and telling me to shut up as I struggled to cry for help. With each smack of my head to the concrete ground, a question echoed through my mind that still haunts me today. Is this going to be how it all ends? What I hadn't realized is that I had been followed the whole way from the moment I parted with that woman at the tube station. Hours later, I was standing topless and bare-legged in front of the police, having the cuts and bruises on my naked body photographed for forensic evidence. Now, there are a few words to describe the all-consuming feelings of vulnerability, shame, upset and injustice that I was ridden with in that moment and for the weeks to come. But wanting to find some way to condense these feelings into something ordered that I could work through, I decided to do what felt most natural to me. I wrote about it. Starting out as a cathartic exercise, I wrote a letter to my assaulter, humanizing him as you, to identify him as part of the very community that he had so violently abused that night. Stressing the tidal wave effect of his actions, I wrote, did you ever think of the people in your life? I don't know who the people in your life are. I don't know anything about you, but I do know this. You did not just attack me that night. I'm a daughter, I'm a friend, I'm a sister, I'm a pupil, I'm a cousin, I'm a niece, I'm a neighbor. I'm the employee who served everyone coffee in the cafe under the railway. And all the people who form these relations with me make up my community, and you assaulted every single one of them. You violated the truth that I will never cease to fight for, and which all of these people represent, that there are infinitely more good people in the world than bad. Now, determined to not let this one incident make me lose faith in the solidarity of my community and humanity as a whole, I recalled the 7-7 terrorist bombings in July 2005 of the London Transport and how the mayor of London at the time, and indeed my own parents, had insisted that we all get back on the tube the next day so that we would not be defined or changed by those who had made us feel unsafe. I told my attacker, you've carried out your attack, but now I'm getting back on my tube. My community will not feel that we are unsafe walking home after dark. We will get on the last tube home and we will walk up our streets alone because we will not ingrain or submit to the idea that we are putting ourselves in danger in doing so. We will continue to come together like an army when any member of our community is threatened. And this is a fight you will not win. Now, at the time of writing this letter, I was studying for my exams in Oxford and working on a local student paper there. And despite being lucky enough to have friends and family supporting me, it was a pretty isolating time. I didn't know anyone who had been through something similar. At least, I didn't think I did. I'd read the news reports, the statistics. I knew how common sexual assault was. And yet, I couldn't actually name a single person that I'd heard speak out about an experience of this kind before. So, in a kind of spontaneous decision, I decided that I would publish my letter in the student newspaper, hoping to reach out to others in Oxford who might have had a similar experience and be feeling the same way. At the end of the letter, I encouraged others to write in with their experiences under the hashtag NotGuilty to emphasize that survivors of assault could express themselves without feeling shame or guilt about what happened to them, to show that we could all stand up to sexual assault. What I never anticipated is that almost overnight, this published letter would go viral. Soon, we were receiving hundreds of stories from men and women across the world, which we then began to publish on the website we set up in response to this traffic we were receiving. There was an Australian mother in her 40s who described how, on an evening out, she was followed to the bathroom by a man who went to repeatedly grab her crotch. 
We had a man from the Netherlands describe how he was date raped on a visit to London and wasn't taken seriously by anyone he reported his case to. I had personal Facebook messages from people in India and South America saying, how can we bring the message of the campaign over there? One of the first contributions we had was from a woman called Nikki, who described growing up being molested by her own father. And I had friends open up to me about experiences ranging from those that had happened last week to those that had happened years ago that I'd had no idea about. And the more that we started to receive these stories, the more we also started to receive messages of hope. People feeling empowered by this community of voices that were standing up to sexual assault and victim blaming. A woman called Olivia, after describing her sexual assault uh, by someone she had trusted and cared about for a long time, said, I've read many of the stories posted on here and I feel more hopeful that if so many women can move forward than I can too. I've been inspired by many and hope I can be as strong as them someday and I'm sure I will. Another anonymous contributor, after describing her assault on public transport in London, said, I'm so proud to be part of Not Guilty, for why should we suffer this form of abuse? People around the world began tweeting under this hashtag, and the letter was republished and covered by the national press, as well as being translated into several other languages worldwide. But something struck me about the media attention that this letter was attracting. For something to be front page news, given the word news itself, we can assume it must be something new or something surprising. But sexual assault is not something new. The UN Secretary General's campaign, Unite, to end violence against women, found that women aged 15 to 44 are more at risk of rape and domestic violence than of cancer, motor accidents, war, and malaria. It's estimated that worldwide, one in five women will become a victim of rape or attempted rape in her lifetime. And in some countries, these figures are even higher. The 2012 study uh, conducted by the UN in New Delhi found that 92% of women there had experienced some kind of sexual violence in a public place. And in some countries, including Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, marital rape is still not recognized as an illegal act. Can I ask you now, just take a look around this room, if you can see everyone, <laughs> the people around you. Taking that worldwide statistic, that means that on average, 70 of the 350 women in this room, that's about a tenth of this room, will experience sexual assault in their lifetime. So why was this story all of a sudden news? Sexual assault, along with other kinds of injustices, are reported in the media all the time. But through the campaign, these injustices were framed as not just news stories. They were first-hand experiences that had affected real people who were creating, with the solidarity of others, what they needed and had previously lacked. A platform to speak out, the reassurance that they weren't alone or to blame for what happened to them, and open discussions that would help to reduce stigma around the issue. The voices of those directly affected were at the forefront of the story not the voices of journalists or commentators on social media. We live in an increasingly interconnected world with the proliferation of social media, which is, of course, a fantastic resource for igniting social change. But it's also made us increasingly reactive. From the smallest annoyances of, oh, my train's been delayed, to the greatest injustices of genocides, war, terrorist attacks, our default response has become to react to any kind of injustice by tweeting, Facebooking, hashtagging, anything to show others that we too have reacted. The problem with reacting in this manner en masse is that it can sometimes mean that we don't actually react at all, not in the sense of actually doing anything anyway. It might make ourselves feel better, feeling like we've contributed to a group mourning or outrage, and got it out of our system, but it doesn't actually change anything. And what's more, it can sometimes drown out the voices of those directly affected, whose voices and needs must be heard. Worrying, too, is our tendency for some reactive responses to build even more walls, being quick to point fingers with the hope of providing easy solutions to complex problems. One British tabloid on the publication of my letter branded a headline stating, Oxford student launches online campaign to shame attacker. But the campaign never meant to shame anyone. It meant to let people speak and to make others listen. Divisive Twitter trolls were quick to create even more injustice, commenting on my attacker's ethnicity or class to push their own prejudice agendas. And some 
even accused me of feigning the whole thing to, quote, push my feminist agenda of man-hating, whatever that is. But, you know, I'm sure most of these people wouldn't say the things that they say in person. But it's if because you might be in private, in the comfort of your own home, behind a screen when on social media, that people forget that what they're doing is a public act, that other people will be reading it and be affected by it. Returning to my example of getting back on our tubes, another main concern I have about this noise that escalates from our online responses to injustice is that it can very easily slip into portraying us as the affected party, which can lead to a sense of defeatism, a kind of mental barrier to seeing any opportunity for positivity or change out of a negative situation. A couple of months before the campaign started, or any of this happened to me, I went to a TEDx event in Oxford, and I saw Zelda Lachansi speak, the former private secretary to Nelson Mandela. And one of the stories she told really struck me. She spoke of when the South African Rugby Union took Mandela to court during his presidency after he commissioned an inquiry into sports affairs. In the courtroom, Mandela went up to the South African Rugby Union lawyers, shook them all by the hand, greeted them each in their own language, and Zelda wanted a protest, saying, you know, they had no right to his respect after this injustice they had caused him. And he turned to her and said, you must never allow the enemy to determine the grounds for battle. Now, at the time of hearing these words, I didn't really understand why they were so important, but I kind of felt that they were and wrote them down in this notebook that I had on me at the time. But I've thought about this line a lot ever since. Revenge, or the expression of hatred towards those who have done us injustice, may feel like a human instinct in the face of wrong, but we need to break out of these cycles if we are to hope to transform negative events of injustice into positive social change. To do otherwise continues to let the enemy determine the grounds for battle. It creates a binary where we who have suffered become the affected, pitted against them, the perpetrators. And just like we got back on our tubes, we can't let our platforms for community and interconnectivity be the places that we settle for defeat. I want you all now just to have a think about the last time that you felt that all-consuming sense of injustice, the kind that really fires you up inside so with this sort of energy that you just have to get out, otherwise it will eat you up. It might have been something in your day-to-day -day lives, an act of discrimination, a comment, or someone just making you feel worthless. Or maybe it was something happening thousands of miles away, an act of war, a life, or many cut short. Whatever it is, just think, how would or did you react? Did you tweet about it? Did you change your profile picture, update your Facebook status? Now, I don't wish to discourage a social media response. I owe the development of the campaign almost entirely to social media. But I do want to encourage a more considered approach to the way we use it to respond to injustice. And the start, I think, is to ask ourselves two things. Firstly, with this example in mind, why do I feel this injustice? In my case, there were several answers to this. Someone had hurt me and those who I loved under the assumption that they would not have to be held to account or recognize the damage that they had caused. Not only that, but thousands of men and women every day suffer from sexual assault, often in silence, and yet it's still a problem that isn't given the same airtime as other issues. It's still an issue many people blame victims for. So next, ask yourself how, in recognizing these reasons, could I go about reversing them? With us, this was holding my attacker and many others to account, calling them out on the effect that they had caused. It was giving airtime to the issue of sexual assault, opening up conversations in the media, amongst friends, amongst families that have been closed for too long, stressing that victims shouldn't feel like they're to blame for what happened to them. We might still have a long way to go in solving this problem entirely, but in this way, we can begin to use social media as an active tool for social justice as a tool to educate, to stimulate dialogues, to make those in positions of authority or policy making aware of an issue by listening to those directly affected by it. Now, sometimes these questions don't have easy answers. In fact, they rarely do. But this doesn't mean we still can't give them a considered response. In situations where you can't go about thinking how you would reverse this reason why you feel injustice, you can still think maybe not what you can do, but what you can not do. You can not fight injustice with more prejudice, more hatred. You can not speak over those directly affected by an injustice. And you can not react to something only to 
forget about it the next day just because the twi rest of Twitter's moved on. Sometimes not reacting instantly is, ironically, the best immediate course of action we can take. Because social change is only going to happen if we become willing to accept that whilst everything else in our lives has become so fast-paced that we've basically lost the notion of what it is to reply, you know, wait for a reply to a text message, let alone revolutionary social change, that some things take time, and a lot more time than the short instant it would take to show others that we had reacted online. Now, in this 15 minutes, I've been part of a new community here in the 700 people in this building. When I leave, I'll be reunited with my friends and family. When I scroll through Facebook or Twitter tonight, I'll engage with another thousand-strong community there. Community, as I stressed in my letter to my attacker, is everywhere, and it is boundless. So let's imagine right now that we hear that in this 15 minutes, an injustice has struck. We're angry, we're energized by this injustice, but let's consider our response. The strength of our numbers, our smartphones, the fact that TEDx Thessaloniki is trending on Twitter in Greece right now has the ability to create a movement. So let us hold people to account without descending into a culture that thrives off shaming and injustice ourselves. Let us remember that distinction so often forgotten by internet users between criticism and insult. Let us not forget to think before we speak just because we might have a screen in front of us. And when we create noise on social media, let it not drown out the needs of those affected, but instead let it amplify our voices and theirs. So that the internet becomes a place where you are not the exception if you speak out about something that has actually happened to you. All these things evoke the very keystones upon which the internet was built. To have network, to have signal, to connect. All terms which imply bringing people together, not pushing people apart. Now, I'm aware that you're all about to go to lunch, so let me leave you with this thought that social media, when bringing people together, is the strongest tool that our generation has. And if we all bring a good, well-considered contribution to this table, then it's like the best and biggest family meal that we've ever had. Galeoxy.